Happy Saturday, risers. Sagar and I are here to revisit some of our favorite interviews from this week, and we definitely had a lot to choose from because it was amazing shows every single day this week, obviously. Um, I went to Kentucky to talk to a whole bunch of people, including the Bluegrass State's Democratic Congressman John Yarmuth. The Hills' Reed Wilson swung by to talk about Joe Biden's plummeting support in Iowa. Sagar talked to friend of the show, Kyle Kalinske, about the rise of populist left-wing politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. But we thought we'd start things off today with our interview with Bernie Sanders' senior advisor, Chuck Rocha. We asked him about how Senator Sanders is able to connect with so well with Latino voters, and in particular, younger Latinos. Here's what he had to say. People come to me all the time and they're like, Chuck, how does Bernie Sanders, a uh, senator from Vermont, do so well in the Latino community? Mm -hmm. I'd love to take full credit for that, but it's not on me. It's not me, it's us. Mm -hmm. So that's literally a slogan, but it's more than a slogan, right? It's because there's people in the campaign, when a piece of literature goes into our community, the Latino community, there's a Latino on the staff who's writing that, who's implementing that, who's getting it out to the state, and then there's a Latino in the state from that community delivering that. That yeah. just don't happen. We make too light of that in presidential campaigns, but that's a real connection to that community and a cultural competency that I don't think any other campaign can mm. touch. Love the hat, first of all. Uh, he, had, he had a great Love shot that. at Elizabeth Warren in there about woke white boys from Harvard writing immigration plans. And yes. that really, <laughs> that really I, I enjoyed. And it was, it's a great kind of differentiator between the two campaigns, which is because he's right, which is that ultimately she's got this like technocratic Harvard staff, which writes all of her plans, everything, you know, ruled from Cambridge. And that's not what the people want. That's it's just not. There's such yeah. a difference between writing the plan with mm -hmm. the woke hard yeah. Harvard boys and then presenting it to the people. Here, we shall solve your yeah, problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Versus actually having the people who are going to be impacted, mm -hmm. integrated into the campaign, integrated into the design process of what the ideas are. And I do think that's a core distinction, so it was interesting to tease that out with Chuck. Yeah. Um, we also talked to rising fan favorite Zed Jelani, explain why Elizabeth Warren appeals to a certain kind of Democrat, kind of similar to what we're talking mm -hmm. about here, and why that could ultimately hurt her chances in a general election. I think Warren is is behaving in a chauvinistic manner that, appear, that appeals to a lot of upper-class liberals that look down, I think, on social conservatives. But that could end up alienating key voter blocks in a lot of these more socially conservative states in a way that I think even the economic populist policies are not doing. I could not agree with Zed more. I mean, he's totally right. Which is, he goes, look at that New York Times poll. Like, you know, it, like we, we have some grappling with, I think the New York Times was very wrong to just say too liberal, too left. Right. They didn't really understand that economic populism is very much okay with people in Michigan and in Pennsylvania and throughout the Midwest. It's the cultural issues that she leans into. Zed was so right, making fun of people who don't believe in gay marriage. I mean, that's just a, that's not a great way to handle yourself. Well, like he said, well, almost 50 percent of african-american democratic voters don't also don't believe in gay marriage yeah isolating key constituencies making fun of almost half the country that's not a, that's not the right way to go to right campaign. it's and this was one of the things we touched on this a few times this week that there are different kinds of left yeah. right there's the right. economic but there's the medicare for all these big sort of radical economic right. ideas at least by the standards of america in the last several decades those actually do fine they do well people embrace them in a lot of parts of the country that democrats lost and need to win mm -hmm. back. And I say this as someone who is culturally left, is economically left. I'm left on basically everything. But you do have to be more careful with the cultural issues when you have a large part of the country that disagrees with you. And it's not so much where you stand on the issue. It's how you talk about it. Yeah. Do you talk about it with love and understanding? Do you talk about it with contempt? Do you put it at the center of your campaign? Do you put your gender pronouns in your Twitter profile? Or are you just there as an ally for the community mm. and, and like that's clear from where you stand? And that's what he's, he said it best. It's chauvinism, the sh elite chauvinism which appeals to the Manhattan people who have true contempt for everybody else who lives in the country. Yeah. And then you have other candidates which, you know, they may be there on the issues, but they are certainly not talking about it like this. I will tell you yeah. what needs to be done for you. I will tell you right. how and where to live. That's the condescension that's been coming from the Democratic Party yeah. for years. Exactly. Finally, we wanted to return to our discussion with the astrophysicist and media personality, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. We talked about a lot of things, but one moment we really wanted to highlight was whenever he started to explain the internet through an extremely useful tool has made it easier to sow divisiveness and discord. The internet has done yeah. to us all is the internet, in addition to what is good about it, what it has done is it, it has enabled all of us to tribalize as never before. Our tribalizing 
um, uh, uh, behaviors historically were, are you, are you the same skin color? Are you the same, do you worship the same God in the sky? Do you live on this side of the line rather than that side? That's where wars were fought over the centuries and over the millennia. We have extra ways to divide ourselves now because the internet makes it easy. I thought it was well said. Uh, it, it is interesting about you know tribalization on the internet, and it's it's funny. I mean, a lot of the social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, all these other things, they said, "Oh, we're going to bring the entire world together." Right. Well, it turns out when the world comes together, that we have a lot that we disagree about. Well, and it's not all the, kumbaya. Right. Anymore. And when yeah. you bring the whole world together, what we really do is like find the people yeah. that are narrowly like us. Yeah. Um, you saw Zuckerberg's speech like a couple weeks ago, where he said he started Facebook because right. of the Iraq War and civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. Mm, I mean, that's like the that was the view, and that's right. the mythology that they still sell themselves is we're bringing people together or we're like you know world harmony et cetera, et cetera, right. and different perspectives when really it's just giving people another way to tribalize and it doesn't have to be that way that's part of it too is it's all in the design of these platforms mm -hmm. but that's what gets clicks that's what gets revenue so that's what's enforced there's always a cost right that's the one thing we always have to learn all right, that does it for us this morning. Be sure to check back here later today for our recurring segment with Katie Halper from Rolling Stone's Useful Idiots podcast, where we break down the week that was in media fails. And then come back tomorrow for another round of Rising Cues. We're going to see you then.